Hello and welcome to the first episode of our amazing historical figures series and we are starting a little farther afield than where one might usually start. There are, of course, the obvious historical figures such as the mighty Richard the Lionheart, his nemesis Saladin, Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan, Cleopatra or Ramesses II of Egypt, but no, we are sailing a ways away from Europe, Africa and Asia and we are heading to the lush, mountainous shores of South America, particularly Peru, and we are starting our first deep dive with the one and only Pachacuti Inca Yupanqui, sponsored by Jeff and Bill. Now, to most of the world, Peru is a small country hidden away on a large continent, overshadowed by the likes of Brazil, Argentina, and Colombia. Obviously, people understand that Peru houses some of the most wonderful sights in the world many mysteries, a serious cocaine industry, and animals both terrifying and creepy, and also just downright goofy. <coughs> that is absolutely enough of that. Pachacuti was born in Cusco, in the palace of Cusicancha, some time before 1438. He was well versed in history, law, language and the handling of quipu, which is a historical way of communication in place of our numbering system, and involved a length of string with a series of knots. Pachacuti's brother, Inca Urco, had been named heir by Viracocha, but it quickly became apparent to Viracocha and the nobles that Urco lacked the natural ability, courage, maturity and sense of conquest that the young Pachacuti possessed. Still, opportunity arose for Pachacuti when a competing tribe, remember this is pre-empire, attacked out of the city of Andahuaylas, west of Cusco. At the report of the Chanca numbers, Viracocha and Urco fled Cusco, deeming it indefensible. But Pachacuti, whether through sheer will to defend his home, or whether he recognised the opportunity to prove his worth, remained at the head of the army. After a night of praying to the Inca creator god and namesake of his father Viracocha, Pachacuti, then known simply as Cusi, defended the city against the Chanca warriors and their chieftain, Usco Vilca, with legends stating that even the women and children joined the battle for their home. And this very battle is where the name Pachacuti derives, for it translates to Earthshaker, or Reformer of the World, as it is said that even the very earth and stones rose to aid them in their defence of the city. The Chanka were routed, their chieftain ran, and the remaining horde fled Cusco in disbelief. In honour of his father, Pachacuti offered all of the spoils of war to him. Being a great insult to Pachacuti, in rejection of his victory, Viracocha gave the spoils to Urco, his heir, who fled the city with him. Shortly following this, the Chanka chieftain, Usco Vilca, regrouped and planted Cusco again. But Pachacuti got word of this through his spies, and instead of waiting, ambushed Usco Vilca's army, actually beheading the Chanka chieftain in battle himself. Upon seeing this, the Chanka finally lost all will to fight and fled back into the west. Following his victory, Pachacuti returned to Cusco in glory, and here the history seems a little muddy. So, I shall put both accounts to you, and please let me know in the comments which one you believe to be accurate. The first is that upon seeing how the populace now viewed Pachacuti, Viracocha had no choice but to abdicate and retired to a small fort above Cusco to live out his years in shame at having fled. Shame. 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 The second is that Pachacuti returned victorious, and remembering the cowardice of his father and brother, as well as the previous insult regarding the spoils, declared himself as the ninth Sapa Inca. Viracocha fled yet again to a fort in the north to hold up with his shame, shame. and eventually die. Although, according to records, he did try, unsuccessfully, to have Pachacuti assassinated. Again, let me know in the comments which story you believe to be most likely. As for Urco, he had fled, and over time raised a number of fighters himself, intent on killing Pachacuti and reclaiming his birthright. Pachacuti, though, was always one step ahead of the game, and he'd heard of Urco's uprising and quickly had it dealt with, killing Urco in the process. Interesting tidbit here is that one of the younger brothers of Pachacuti, Inca Roca, threw a stone at Urco so hard that it knocked him into a river where he battled the current, finally reaching a rock called Chupalusca, his only potential dry land. Unfortunately for him, Pachacuti and Roca knew this, 
and were waiting there to kill him. On the back of his crushing victory over the superior Chanka force and the removal of his father and brother, Inca Morale soared, and opposing factions and tribes believed the Inca to be supported by the Divine. Pachacuti took full advantage. Over the coming 20 years, he would forge his legacy, becoming an outstanding ruler, a fearless and skilled tactician, a shrewd diplomat, and a fierce yet fair conqueror. To begin with, he entirely remade and expanded Cuzco, further fitting his name. He then set out to expand his territory. Tribe after tribe and city after city fell to the growing Inca Empire. But Pachacuti was smart. As the army grew, so did his empire, and he understood that sheer intimidation alone would win most cities and tribes over. Rather than kill them, as many leaders over countless ages have done all around the globe, he offered them a place in his empire. If they accepted, which most did, they were completely unharmed, and he had schools built for them, and medicines and food supplied to them. His army grew, and using the resources and expertise of the societies and cities he'd come to rule, they soon became unopposable, not only in number, but in equipment. When Pachacuti's all-conquering army reached the gates of Vilcabamba to the northwest of Cusco, they quickly folded. The Vilcabambans had known of Pachacuti's approach long before he arrived, but the sight of the army at his back scared them so much there was no resistance. Legend has it that the leader of Vilcabamba was so petrified to face them that he beheaded one of his own generals who was insistent on resistance. Next came the Soras, a province in Chanka, and I mean, think about it, the leader of the largest army you've ever seen, who are all armed to the teeth with top of the range armor and weaponry. Offer you peace, as long as you submit. Otherwise, well, let's just say things might not go so well for you. I think it's fair to say you take the peace, right? Not the Soras. They decided to put up a fight and were almost immediately subdued. Isn't there something you'd like to say? There sure is. Kids, you tried your best and you failed miserably. The lesson is, never try. Following the victory against the Soras, it was on to Huamanga City in the Ayacucho region. A notoriously warlike people, and they put up a resistance. But a protracted siege by Pachacuti's army eventually won out, forcing a surrender from what were now the starving and thirsty natives. Next, he travelled to the Jauja Valley, heading back towards Cusco, where he met resistance some 30,000 strong. But again, Pachacuti, who everyone still believed to be backed by some deific force, came out the victor. Following this, the army divided, with Pachacuti sending half of his force further north of Vilcabamba with his son Tupac. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, wrong one. Ah, that's better, that's him. Pachacuti's sights were set firmly on Lake Titicaca to the southeast, which would become the southernmost border of his empire. And along the way, he conquered more fierce societies, such as the Lupaca and Koya tribes, the latter of which gave Pachacuti the toughest of fights. The fight lasted an entire day, and Pachacuti, in an effort to spur his troops to victory, ridiculed them, saying, and I quote, O oh, Incas of Cusco, conquerors of all the land, are you not ashamed that people so inferior to you and unequal in weapons should be equal to you and resist for so long a time? End quote. Although I doubt he said that in English, as that would be very weird. After all of the conquesting, Pachacuti returned to Cusco to rule over the lands he'd brought to heal. He proved just as adept at governance as he was at warfare, and he's responsible for providing a number of laws that contributed to the continued dominance of the Inca Empire. He invented a taxation system that would keep the conquered leaders in check, forcing upon them a percentage take of their sheep, cloth, maize and gold. Pachacuti, of course, is also credited with bringing us one of the grandest archaeological sites in the world. Machu Picchu. High above the sacred valley of the Incas, otherwise known as Urubamba Valley, sits a citadel, thought to be the private residence of our Sapa Inca, Pachacuti. Some 50 miles from Cusco, it sits amongst the clouds at a height of 8,000 feet, a fitting residence for a leader thought to be backed by the gods. In 1471, Pachacuti became terminally ill, and after 33 years as Sapa Inca, he passed away in his palace, in the beloved city of Cusco, the same city he saved all those years ago.
Thank you so much for watching this video and sticking it out till the end. I hope you learned something new. Um, if you did enjoy the video, please feel free to like and subscribe. It would absolutely make my day. If there's anything you think I should make a video about in future, please pop it in the comments below the video and we'll go from there. You can also support me, Jeff and Bill over on Patreon. And if you sponsor for three months, you will get a free copy of my novel upon release. But until next time, have a fantastic day. Take care of yourselves. Bye bye.